All right, we just hit 20. I think we can get started. So as yep. in all the other lectures, there's first the recorded part, and then uh, there's a Q&A session at the end. So let's start with the recording. All right, welcome everyone to the Matoka Bootcamp lecture on security best practices. This lecture is given by Venkatesh and myself, Rural Storms. We are both product security engineers with Affinity. So we work for the product security team and our responsibility there is to guarantee security of the internet computer. We do that, for example, by doing code reviews or design reviews on the internet computer replica software, but we also review the most important canisters such as the NNS or SNS code or the internet identity code. What we also try to do is to maintain a list of security best practices. And we maintain this list on internetcomputer.org. Um, so there's a, an example here of what these pages look like. We keep on extending them uh, the more we learn about existing vulnerabilities. And this is really based on our experience while doing these reviews, stuff that pops up that we see are common mistakes. So before you start really uh, diving into development on the internet computer, I really urge you to have a look at these um, uh, at these pages. They can really help you out. Um, if you're really developing a high risk application, it also makes sense that before you go live, you have a third party audit uh, to have some external security specialists have a look at your application, because there's, of course, a, a lot of uh, risk involved with some of these. If you have any feedback on anything uh, related to security for the Internet computer, uh, such as this documentation, but also security considerations that you might have or questions that you might have, you can always reach us on the forum, uh, forum.definity.org or you can just use the QR code here on the right. So any questions or feedback is always welcome or if you want to open up a discussion. Uh, if you have any questions about this talk, you can um, ask them at the end. Uh, we will leave about 10 minutes for questions. And uh, you can also reach us on Discord of the Motoko Bootcamp. So for today, we have four different topics lined up. So the, the security topics that we found most interesting uh, or uh, most important uh, to, to share with you guys. The first one is about intercanister calls and state changes, where we will see a, a type of vulnerability called the double spend vulnerability, uh, how it manifests itself on the IC and how to prevent it. Then Venkatesh will take over to discuss the randomness API and how you need to uh, be mindful of the entropy that you have and how to use the randomness API properly. Then there's a topic on the time API, because contrary to how the time API works in other environments, there, there are some caveats here uh, to use it properly. And then the final topic is on certified variables. Um, certified variables allow you to guarantee integrity of the data that is re uh, coming from the internet computer while still developing high performing applications. And then if all goes well, uh, all of this takes about 50 minutes and it leaves us with 10 minutes of Q&A. So definitely write down your questions for this last 10 minutes, uh, post them in chat where we can find them and answer them. All right, let's dive in, um, starting with intercanister calls and state changes. Before we uh, discuss the problem, let's briefly introduce the example that we're going to be working on. So we have some example code, and this example code consists of two different canisters. The one on the left is just a simple ledger. This, uh, in practice, this could be something like the third, uh, the ICP ledger, where you have some balance that you're managing for your users. And in this case, we have three accounts, one for Rule, Venkatesh, and Robin. They don't hold any tokens on the ledger. There's also the DEX canister. Uh, the DEX canister also holds some balances for our users because the users are trading on the DEX, so they need some tokens to trade with, and the DEX needs to keep track on um, who has how many tokens. At some point in time, the users might want to withdraw or refund their tokens from the DEX back to the ledger. Uh, so let's say Robin wants to refund the seven tokens he has. Uh, he would like to transfer them from the DEX to the ledger, and uh, he wants that to be successful without losing his tokens, and the DEX also would like this to happen without creating new tokens out of thin air. Um, so let's briefly have a look at our code, uh, which I created here. So we, like I said, we had the DEX canister and the simple ledger. Um, both have a Motoko uh, file 
that implement these canisters. And like I said, the ledger is pretty simple. It only has two functions. One function allows a caller to deposit some amount, an amount uh, which is a natural number, and that amount will be deposited in an account which is identified by the principal. Then we also have a second method to check the balance of a certain account to check uh, what we're doing. And this get balance function will actually be called from our decks to see what the balances are uh, for our different users. Then we jump into the DEX canister. The DEX keeps track of balances in this uh, local balances variable, which is a hash map, and it maps principles to, again, natural numbers. And these natural numbers, they uh, indicate the balance or the, the, the amount of tokens that someone has. This canister also implements a few functions. The first one is a very simple init account function. And this is just to bootstrap our example. This is to give Robin, for example, his seven tokens or to give Rule his uh, 1,000 tokens. Um, then we have the get local balance function, which will uh, fetch the local balance for the person calling this. So when Robin calls this, then uh, Robin's uh, balance is stored in the caller balance. In case we call, this is called by someone who doesn't have um, any entry in the local balances, then it will be a default value of zero. And uh, when this is successful, the loc the caller balance will be printed out together with the principal ID uh, as a result of this call. Then we have a second get balance to get the balance of the user on the ledger. And here we do an intercanister call. So we call the simple ledger dot get balance to retrieve uh, similar information, but then the balance of the user on the other canister or on the ledger. <clears throat> And then finally, the most interesting function is the refund function. The refund function uh, will refund for our caller the balance that he has on the DEX. And how does it work? Well, on the first line here, we will again uh, access the hash map, the local balances, to get the balance of our caller. In case the caller does not exist, we will use the default value of zero, and we will store that in caller balance. And then on the second line, we will make an intercanister call uh, we will call the deposit function to deposit this caller balance for uh, the certain caller. So this will effectively increase Robin's account on the ledger uh, with a value of seven. If that intercanister call was successful, the result is okay. Then we execute line 35, which is to update the local balance for Robin to zero, because of course he now transferred his seven tokens, so he should no longer have seven tokens on the DEX. Uh, to keep the total amount of tokens the same as before the refund function. Then after all of this has been done, we have this dummy function called update statistics after refund. So in practice, this could be something to keep track of how many refunds we have done um, or to keep track of how many refunds every person has done. It doesn't really matter what it does. Uh, but in our implementation, what's important is that there is a programming bug in this function. And this programming bug in our case is an assert false which, as we know, will trap or cause a panic, or as uh, people uh, who write Java might know it as throwing an exception. So basically, this code aborts and fails to execute properly, uh, and that's why we put it in here. All right, so that's our example code. Let's jump back into the slides. The double spending vulnerability that we are going to discuss here is actually an attacker who wants to call this refund function twice and thereby also successfully withdrawing the same amount twice. So actually increasing his amount of tokens, creating tokens out of thin air. Um, we will see how these double spend vulnerabilities are created by uh, having some problems with intercanister calls and, and how messages are scheduled. And we will also see how to avoid them. To understand the vulnerability, we first need to understand what is a message. And a message on the IC is just a set of consecutive instructions, so uh, a set of operations, lines of code, if you will, that are executed one after the other. A message is always um, executed either entirely or not at all, um, and it is executed without interruptions. A single message is executed uh, at one point in time and on one canister, and no other message is executed on that same canister at that same time. So if we have four messages and they all um, affect the same canister, then as time goes by, 
they will all take place one after the other. And it also means that message two will execute on the state that is the result of applying message one to the canister. The same goes for message three. It will be uh, applied to the state the canister is in after applying message two. And in that sense, after applying all four messages, the state should remain consistent. For us, that could mean that the total amount of tokens remains unchanged. That for us could mean a consistent state. Okay, let's uh, bring back our refund function. So our refund function, um, you could think that this would only be one message, but there is some sort of optimization going on here. Because our refund function doesn't enter canister call, and an enter canister call could take some time to execute. The canister might not even be running on the same subnet, but it might be running on another subnet, which makes it even longer to execute. So the IC puts this code uh, leading up to the intercanister call and the triggering of the intercanister call itself, it puts it into one message. So for this code, we know it will be executed um, either altogether or not at all, and all at the same time, right? Uh, so just one instruction after the other. Now, the second part of this code, everything that deals with the response coming from the intercanister call and all the code that we put afterwards, that is part of a second message. So the IC will put this in a callback, and that callback is triggered once we get a reply from the simple ledger dot deposit function. You see, the this line is in both uh, of the messages. That's because internally, of course, this line uh, depicts both the sending of the message and receiving the response and storing it in results. So you can actually split this up uh, if you go more again granular into uh, this function itself. Now, um, as we said, every message takes place one after the other. And in this case, it's very clear that the second message can only take place after the first one has executed. Because if the first message would not execute, we wouldn't have an intercanister call and we wouldn't have this callback message. So here we can be very certain that this is going to be the ordering. But that's the only guarantee that we get. <coughs> so what would happen if our function would panic? Right? We've seen the statistics function panics. Well, if this panic ha happens within the first message, within this orange code block, then the intercanister call will not be triggered and everything within this code block will be thrown away. So none of the state changes that, that uh, are a result of this code block would apply. If the trap happens within this first message, that actually means that the result is as if the example function was never called because there's no state changes whatsoever. Now, things change a bit if the panic happens in the second message, because the first message has completed entirely, it has sent the intercanister call, and now it's considered done. So everything we've done up till now is applied to the state of the canister. If that inter uh, canister call does something in another canister, that is also a state change that takes place in the other canister. But everything in the second part of our code of this function will not be applied because we have a panic here. And we as developers might think, OK, someone's calling the example function, so all of this code executes. If we're a bit smarter, we might know that it could throw an exception or panic and none of the code is executed at all. But in this case, it's a bit weird because only half of our code is actually uh, executed and um, has an effect. And if we don't take that into account very carefully, then we might end up with an inconsistent state. Um, let's have a look at uh, how this then works on uh, in our example. Um, no, let's first look at it on this slide. So we, we again have our code and our trap happens in the update statistics of the refund. So everything here in the orange box was successful. We got our local balance of Robin's account. So the caller balance will be seven. We deposit seven in Robin's ledger account. So we will gain seven tokens on the ledger. But then the update of local balances to put Robin's local balance back to zero, this will not apply because none of the code here in the blue box will actually take any effect due to the panic. Um, how can we avoid this? Well, you can avoid trapping or panicking. And this is can only be done by really carefully reviewing your code so you, you don't have any programming bugs that can cause it. Let's have a look if we deploy our code and um, we go through our example what, what actually happens in practice. So we deployed our code. Uh, let's have a look at the 
canister balance or the ledger balance of our account. It starts out uh, our account, this is the, the principal ID, and it starts out as being zero. This is exactly what we expect because it's in the, uh, the initial state. If we go and look at our local balance, it's also still zero because we haven't initialized our example yet. So let's give Robin an initial am amount of seven. We call init account with a natural number of seven. Um, and this will effectively update the local balance. All right, so now we are ready to call the refund function. Robin has seven tokens on the DEX, but none on the ledger. Let's uh, call this refund. The refund, as we expected, traps, right? And it does that at line 41, which if we look at our code is uh, here in the update statistics after refund. So as we know, none of this code actually executed. Let's double check. If we now look at the ledger balance, which is part of the in, is the result of the inter canister call, the ledger balance was updated to be seven, and this is as we expect. This first part of the code was executed, and the ledger was updated. But now let's have a look at the local balance, which gets updated in the second message. Well, the local balance is still seven, so now we have seven tokens on the ledger and seven tokens on the deck. So we created seven tokens out of thin air. Since we still have seven tokens on the local balance, we can actually keep on calling the refund function. So if an attacker would discover such a panic in the way it exists in our code, he could keep on refunding. And every time he does, the ledger balance keeps on increasing with seven tokens. And you can do this a couple of times more. So as our slides indicated, how can we solve this? Well, we need to carefully review this code so it doesn't panic. In our example, it's pretty simple. We just uh, turn our assert false into an assert true, and then it will, will no longer panic. Let's uh, uninstall our code and redeploy it to see if this actually solves everything and what our code does uh, after fixing it. We will again give Robin an initial balance of seven. We will check his local balance and his ledger balance. And both are uh, the ledger balance is zero and the local balance is seven. Now, if we call the refund, uh, not like this, of course, like this, then we will see um, the response of this refund function already indicates that there has been a deposit of seven tokens. Um, let's have a look at the ledger balance that should have become seven, which was already the case before. But now also our local balance, which gets updated in the second part of our code, gets updated to be zero. So we, we're back in a consistent state. The total amount of tokens remains seven. Perfect. We already saw and solved our first vulnerability. Um, let's have a look at uh, another type of vulnerability that we could have. To understand the second part of the, the second vulnerability, we must understand that if we have different messages, it's up to the IC to schedule them. The IC can choose in what order, not, not particularly in what order, but, uh, well, yeah, no, in what order it wants to schedule them. Of course, we still have the constraint that the second message can only happen after the first one has happened. But let's say we call the refund function twice. So two people or the same person triggers this refund function more or less at the same time which will put the first message, this orange one, in the scheduler, and the scheduler needs to choose which one to pick. So let's say a possible ordering of these two messages will be that the scheduler picks the first message of the first call. It executes this, and then it chooses to pick the second message of the first call, and it executes this. This all seems to be fine, right? The local balance gets updated to zero. And this is exactly what we observed uh, earlier when, when I showed you in the demonstration. Um, Robin gets a refund of seven tokens and the total balance is accurate. The second caller now arrives with this message. The message gets scheduled. And uh, here on line one, the caller balance is retrieved. Now the caller balance is gonna be zero because Robin's local account balance is zero. There will be a deposit, but it's a deposit of zero tokens, and there will be an update of the local balances, and it's again zero. So overall, after executing both calls, one after the other, the complete state remains consistent. But this is only one potential ordering. It's also possible that the IC scheduler chooses 
to schedule first the first message of the first call and then the second message of the first call. Well, if it does that, the first time it schedules this message, the caller balance will become seven because Robin still has balance seven. And then by executing the first message of the second call, it again will fetch the scholar balance, but it's still seven because there has been no code executed to update the local balance to zero. So we will trigger this simple ledger dot deposit twice, twice with a caller balance of seven, twice for our user Robin. So we expect that after this has been done, Robin will end up with 14 tokens instead of seven. Then the second message of the first call takes place. So the local balance gets updated to zero and the second message of the second call does the exact same thing. Let's have a look if this actually works as we expected. So um, the local balance, let's give Robin again uh, some, some balance. Let's give him seven tokens. The ledger balance, well, it's still seven from our previous example, but let's leave it at that. Our local balance is also seven. And now let's call this refund function a couple of times, but quickly one after the other. To do this, I created a small exploit script. And what it does is it's just a for loop. So from one to 10, and it will print the index. So again, from one to 10, and then it will call our dex canister with the refund function. You can see this ampersand at the end. That's just so it works uh, somewhat in parallel, uh, because if you don't do this, then the shell uh, will wait until the call has returned. But we want to do uh, parallel calls, so that's why we put the ampersand here. Okay, let's run our exploit. What we will see first is uh, a figure one to 10, meaning these are the 10 times the call is triggered. And then we will see 10 responses. The first response here already identifies that we have a deposit of seven tokens for Robin's account on the ledger. The second response is exactly the same. And as you can observe, all 10 of the responses have actually successfully deposited seven tokens. So we can expect that the ledger balance will not be 14, the initial seven plus this refund seven, but it might be a lot more. And indeed, it's a lot more, it's 77 tokens. So actually we had seven, uh, 10 times seven tokens being refunded. If you do this on your local machine, you could even have it a couple of dozen times that the refund is successful before this, the second message that resets the local balance gets executed. If you do this on mainnet, um, you can also get a couple of refunds before you actually get your local balance set to zero. All right. Um, so this is clearly an issue, right? We created, um, yeah, what is it, uh, 30, 36 tokens out of thin air, and this is not what we want. How can we prevent this? Well, it's pretty simple if you know it. Uh, it's by applying this locking pattern. And you know locks if you've done some multi-threaded programming in other languages. Often you also need to lock some part of the code so it can't run in parallel. It's a similar mechanism. What we do here, uh, it's, it's some dummy code on line two. The first, very first thing you would do is to check if your function is locked. If it is locked, you just return an error. If it isn't locked, then you go to line three and you actually lock the function because you only want it to be executed once at the same time. Then you can do all the other stuff that you want. So you can do your intercanister calls, you can update state. And then at the very end, you unlock your function again so that it's available for other people to call. Let's try to implement this solution. So a simple lock could be just a Boolean, right? Let's uh, create this lock and let's make it a Boolean. And let's uh, initialize it to false, right? Initially, uh, the refund function isn't locked, so it's false. Now, uh, the first thing we have to do is to check if the function is locked. So if the lock is true, then we want to return. And what do we want to return? Well, we actually want to return an error. And that error says something like uh, refund already in progress. Please try again later. We need to end this with semicolon. And then um, if it isn't locked, the first thing we need to do is lock it. So we would set our lock uh, to true. And then at the very end, just before we return, we release our lock again, and we release that lock by setting it to false. Good, let's redeploy and see if this works. 
let's uninstall our code to clear all our state. And now let's deploy. Again, we're going to give Robin an initial balance of seven tokens. I'm going to show you that his local balance is seven and his ledger balance is zero. And then we're going to just run our exploit again. Our exploit triggers 10 refunds. And what you see now is that one of the results is the same as we've seen earlier. We've deposited seven tokens, but all of the other reason, uh, results say that a refund is already in progress. So you need to try again later. The result is exactly as we expected. The ledger balance uh, is increased only to seven and not to 70, and the local balance is uh, reduced to zero. So we effectively mitigated this vulnerability, this double spend issue that we had. Now, if you observe this um, implementation, you notice that we're locking the complete function, right? We Nobody else can enter when one person is doing a refund. If our DEX is very popular and we have uh, Venkatesh and Rule and Robin trying to refund at the same time, they will have to wait for one another uh, to finish. But actually, that's not necessary. If Robin's doing a refund, then Venkatesh at the same time can also do a refund because they're not intervening with each, with each other's state. To implement this locking mechanism, you could actually keep track of who is doing a refund and only allow that one person to do a refund allow only allow a person to do one refund at a time but to still allow multiple persons to do a refund and to do that i've put some code on the slide you can also try this out yourself we don't have to, uh, enough time to really demo this but uh, we do this by having a second hash map that keeps track of ongoing transactions and in that ongoing transactions we keep uh, a list of the callers um, who, who are doing a refund so on line five we will put the caller in this list. This signifies that it is locked for this caller. And then at the very end, we will remove the caller again uh, to free up the lock. All right, so just a short recap. Uh, if you have any intercanister calls, which you can find easily by looking at these await keywords, then you know that your code is split up into two messages and you need to take into account that they might not be scheduled one after the other. There might be another message intervening and you need to take care as a programmer that if this is the case, your code is still leading to an inconsistent state. You can implement a locking mechanism and try to make your locks as granular as possible so to, as to keep uh, still keep your code uh, high performing so that there's still some sort of parallelism possible. Uh, for us developers, releasing your locks, you can also do this in the drop implementation, which makes sure that it's always called. Even in case of a panic, the drop method or the drop uh, implementation is always called at the end. This is it for the first uh, topic. Now I hand the floor to, uh, to Venkatesh for the remaining three. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Venkatesh and I'll be taking the rest of the lecture uh, talking about randomness, time, and certified variables. Let's talk about randomness first. So why do we need secure randomness in the IC or in any system, especially in the IC? You need, for example, if you're building any kind of application, specifically in these categories, for example, minting a randomized NFT from a collection, you want to add drop tokens to a randomized set of participants among a pool, or you want to develop, a, for example, a procedural generation game or any casino-based games. All these games require some kind of unpredictability or randomness to make the game more fair and uniform among all the players. So that's why we need randomness in, in any kind of system. So when we call secure randomness what do we mean by secure randomness uh basically there are a couple of requirements first one is unbiased so the value shouldn't be influenced by anyone and then unpredictability unpredictability means the value is unknown to anyone before the value is released released out now before going into more into randomness and IC, we'll see first some traditional sources of randomness. In Linux, the seed is consumed from different peripherals and exposed via dev slash random and dev slash u random through a cryptographically secure PRNG. In Windows, again, the seed is collected from like a variety of sources when you boot up the system and it's stored in this uh, path. Cloud, some people want to do a bit more fancy stuff. Cloudflare uses Lava RAN for randomness. 
where they have this array of lava lamps, which are present in their main office. And there is a camera pointing towards this lava lamp. And it takes pictures periodically to generate the seed from which they generate the randomness. Randomness in the IC. So the IC exposes a system API called IC0.rorand, which accepts no input. And in return, it provides you 32 bytes of cryptographically secure randomness. The return value is unknown to any party on the IC at time of the submission of the call. And this is how we get uh, unpredictability. Uh, every new call to this method generates a new return value. So you can you can be sure that every time you call, make this call, you'll get like fresh randomness. In Motoko, uh, you can invoke this randomness by calling the random module. Uh, and if you invoke random.blob, it will give you 32 bytes of secure randomness. Now, how do you use this randomness? There are two way, methods of using the secure randomness, which you got from random.blob. Uh, yeah, but how do you make it into discrete source of randomness? So this is like a 32 bytes of blob, but typically when you want to use this randomness, your example in JavaScript, you have this math or get random, which provides your range value between a certain range. So how do you do that? So the first way is that uh, you provide the secure randomness directly into this method, uh, uh, into the method. But developers needs to be cautioned here that they need to take care of the randomness management. Uh, what I mean by that is here, uh, sorry about that. Here, uh, as you can see, uh, I invoked the ra random module, I call the blob method. So now my the entropy variable holds like 32 bytes of randomness. I pass this 32 bytes to random.byte from, which is again uh, a method which consumes this entropy and provide me one byte of randomness. There are many applications which require like one byte of randomness. They can use make use of it. So random byte one variable holds one byte of randomness and again provide the same entropy again to random byte uh, random dot byte from to get random byte two. So, but the issue here is that uh, since these methods are stateless. Uh, every time it's going to consume the first byte again as like fresh source of entropy. So if you do uh, assert random byte one equal to random byte two, this is always going to be true. And so the main concern here when using this kind of methods is that you always need to make sure when you provide the entropy or secure randomness into these methods, you need to make sure they are always fresh and they haven't been used before in previous methods. Now. Moving on to the second type of uh, randomness usage, where you can see this finite class, which Motoko provides and use its method. This is a much more recommended way of uh, using the secure randomness as it provides way to handle if you have run out of entropy and you need to reset it. This class, uh, the, cl the finite class is stateful. It handles the entropy management. So you need to only seed it once. And as long as it doesn't run out, uh, you can keep consuming different methods which the finite class of the, the random method exposes. Once the randomness exhausted from the finite class, all subsequent method calls to this uh, uh, to the finite uh, to the random method, to these methods will always return null. So th this allows developers to know that I have ran out of randomness and I need to reseed it. Let's have a method here. Let's have a look at an example here. Uh, so here I call uh, let entropy equal to random dot blob. And now I in, in invoke the finite class and seed it with this entropy. I uh, consume two bytes from f dot byte and f dot uh, in byte one and byte two. But you know, since the finite class is stateful, uh, it consumes the first byte of the fresh randomness in first call. And in the second one, it, uh, second one, it consumes the second byte of the randomness. As you can see, the this is like, if you assert random byte equal to random two, it can be true or false because at some since it's every the, each the byte value which you can get is completely random. It can be true or uh, uh, it, it can be the same value or it can be a different value. Now let's see a uh, live example of using the finite class. Uh, here I have a canister which is called 
it's an act of randomness and it exposes a function called random bias. The random bias accepts a, uh, accepts a natural number n. The use of the random number, use of the random bias function is that you provide value n, say for example, 20, and in return, it will uh, return you back 20 bytes of proper randomness. Going more, more into the function, we, I have a byte array, which is a, just a normal array, which can hold this random bytes. Uh, I enter the, uh, get the secure randomness from the by invoking random dot blob, and I seed the entropy into the finite class to uh, which is available via this variable f. Now I iterate over the range zero to n minus one, which is the one uh, n which was provided in the function input, and each byte array value is stored by by stored with a random byte co by calling f dot byte. Once this is done, I return the function by uh, return the function uh, with the byte array. Now let's test it out. Uh, I'm going to call for 20 bytes. It takes some time to make the call. And as you can see, it returned me back with 20 bytes of randomness. But as I noted here, like noted before, that you need to make sure that you reseed your entropy when you run out. Uh, since we know that the entropy, uh, the we get 20, 32 bytes of entropy when we invoke random dot blob, let's give a number that is greater than 32. For example, like 40. And as you can see, once it run out after 32 bytes, the remaining values are returned as null. So this is the main advantage of working with finite class. So you know how to uh, you, when you have run out of entropy. Going to a proper example, uh, this is like a same example from the previous implementation, but now I've invoked a place where I have a switch case when I invoke f dot byte, which when it provides a value, it consumes the value and adds it to the byte array. But if the f dot byte method returns a null, then I receive the entropy by awaking random, random dot blob again. This is fresh due to a source of 32 bytes of entropy, and I see it in the finite class. And this is done in a loop so that uh, whenever you keep on calling, uh, like for example, 96 bytes, uh, it will receive the randomness twice. Let's test it out with 96. Yeah, that took a while, but as you can see, there are no null values, and all these values are fresh random uh, random bytes, which are which are derived from the random source of uh, secure randomness. And that concludes randomness. Now we are going to jump into time. Where do we want to tie and talk about time? Every canister requires time because you want to know when something happens, you want to log it or you want to record it. And this is very important for, for, for example, financial transaction. The main concept uh, in Motoko, uh, the canisters can obtain current time by querying the system API of IC0 time, which gives you the nanoseconds since 1970, uh, and it's going to be an integer. In Motoko, you can use uh, the time module now the main concern here is that uh, time is not strictly increasing in the IC. What do I mean by that is time one, I invoke time one, the variable time one with time dot now. So this holds the current time. Then in the next uh, following call, I again invoke time two with time dot now. Again, in a, in a traditional setting, some time has passed between the first call and the second call. So the time must have increased. Since it's nanoseconds, you definitely have an increase, but the only guarantee that IC provides that is that time two will be greater than or equal to time one. So when I invoke time two, you uh, you can't be sure that time two will always be greater than time one, but there are many instances uh, where time two can still be equal to time one. From the view of the canister, the API can return the same time on multiple invocations of uh, multiple invocations of this time API as long as the messages are executed in the same block. 
security concern. Now, why does uh, it concern security? For example, in case of financial transactions in a traditional system, uh, you have like a lot of uh, transactions coming in. Uh, with timestamp, you can know when the transaction happened, as well as you can also achieve uh, ordering of transactions. But in the IC for a single canister, the timestamps uh, time stamps alone are sufficient. As you saw, for if I'm having like multiple transactions and they executed the same message, uh, they will all have the same timestamp. And you, uh, you now don't know which, if A was executed before B, unless you know the code or if you're just looking at record, there is no way to tell. Now, how one can solve this, one must employ like logical counters or clocks to safely guarantee the order of other transactions. And this is in lieu with how you solve how, how to deal with async programming in rules lecture. Now, let's see a live example of the time API. Uh, here I have a factorial canister. This basically uh, uh, accepts any value n and then returns back the n factorial of the value. Uh, I've deployed this canister and I know the canister ID. In an, another canister, I have this timestamper, which has the definition for the factorial canister. It has an array of size 10 and it can record the timestamps. And in the set timestamps function, I iterate over the range zero to nine. Since this is inclusive, I'm gonna iterate over 10 times. And each time I increase this, uh, this J value with the iterated time size. Size is the value which you provide as input to the set timestamp function. And this J value is used to as the input for the factorial computation method. So uh, this is going to, for example, if I provide a size of 10, 100, 100, this J is going to be 100, 200, 300, 400, up to 1000. And every time after I compute the uh, factorial computation, the timestamp is recorded by timestamp now in the timestamp array. Then I return back the array. Now let's see what happens if I call for 100. So this is like somewhat significant computation since you're calculating 100 factorial, 200 factorial. Uh, but let's see what the value is. As you can see, it completed the call and it has written down, I mean, 10 timestamps, but all these timestamps are equal because all of them were executed in the same message. Uh, you never pushed uh, pushed out of the, not in the same message, but in the same block, since it, you never went out of the block, all of them recorded the same time. Now let's try to push them out of the block, the next block. I'm calling again with 1000. 1000 is like a much more far intensive computation than calling for 100. Now let's wait for the output. And as you can see, the first, uh, six messages fit inside the block. The rest of them went outside, so they all have different timestamps. And if if you have like financial transactions for these first six messages, now you have no idea of knowing which event happened at what time. Uh, you know they all happened at the same time, but you don't have an ordering for this event. So you can solve that by using a, a counter. This is the same example as before. But now I have a logical counter, which runs along with the iterator. You can also use the iterator value, but the counter is to make sense for as a logical counter and how it's implemented. So each time it's run in the loop, I increment the counter and the timestamp array now holds both a natural number, which is the counter and the integer, which is the time. Now let me try to return thousand, call for this time again, set timestamps method and see what the value is written. And we can see for these first six values, first six records, uh, they all have the same timestamp, but now you have this logical counter which says, okay, this record zero, and this timestamp is the one which occurred first, this one and the same timestamp occurred second. So in a financial setting, now you know which way the events occurred, or you can safely guarantee that this is the way the flow of events occurred. And back to the slideshow. So this was in the case of single canister. Now what happened, this gets really interesting in uh, a multi-canister setting, but this is just a bonus slide and I want to take it like more as a 
take home and look at the look at this part. So the times absorbed by different canisters are unrelated. So canister A has like a different view of time, and canister B has, has a different view of time. So when there is a call initiated from canister A to canister B, it can be that uh, and uh, canister A to canister B and B sends a response of the time. The time uh, sent to back to the canister A for it, it could look like it came from the future or from the past. So there is no relate, uh, reliable way of ordering transactions across a multi canister system where canisters are talking with each other by only depending upon the current time. However, this is if you only use the current time. Uh, there is a reliable way of achieving ordering among multiple canisters, which you can achieve by using logical clocks. And you can check it out this paper if you want to see how you can actually implement it. Moving on, we go to certified variable. So what are certified variables? Before looking at the certified variables, we want to see about the two types of calls which are present in the IC, which is a query call and an update call. Uh, in Motoko, these are the methods which you write in the actor, which you use to interact between canisters or for the client to interact with the canister. Uh, the query call is analogous to a read method, uh, just a read, and, and the update call is analogous to both read and write. The query call is executed on a single replica node chosen at random in a subnet. So the boundary node is the one that the client interacts to and the boundary node chooses a single replica node on random and it waits for the response from the replica node and returns it back to the client. So since you need to only talk to one replica node, this has very fast response time, but it is relatively less secure because you have no integrity protection. The data which the node is responding, uh, the uh, responding node might be honest or it might be malicious as well. So it, it can just return your false data and there is no way of you knowing. But on an update call, the request is replicated among multiple nodes and it goes through consensus and the response is, response is threshold signed by the subnet. However, since it needs to be replicated among multiple nodes, this is relatively slower and is also more ex uh, expensive to make the update call. However, this is a secure response since it's executed by multiple nodes, uh, you and it goes through consensus, uh, it is certified by a subnet, and this guarantees the integrity of the data which you receive. So, how do, can we do better? Can I have a query call which has the security of the uh, integrity which the update call offers? Yeah, you can using certified data. Just a basic flow of how you use certified data. There is a client one who's having who's doing multiple updates to this data. On his first update call, along with updating the data, he sets this data into a certified data store. And then the, when he sets this data, a new certificate is generated for the data. This data, this certificate allows one to validate whether the integrity of the data which was set into the certificate data store. So when he calls the first time, the certificate for the data is set. Now he calls the second time, the data is updated and the new certificate is also generated. So the certificate, this is automatic. If you, every time you are just have the set method to store the data uh, on subsequent calls, the data keeps on, you know, the certificate keeps on get updating. Now there is another client who wants to query this data. When he queries the data, he also gets back the certificate along with this response, uh, which he can just validate with the IC root key. So he will get a fast response and along with the data, you'll also get the certificate, which can be validated by the IC root key. This is the same thing which I explained, which in more described text. The only thing to note here is that the amount of data which you can store in the certificate store uh, is very small. You can store only 32 bytes, uh, which, but we can get over this by using some special data structures. Uh, now, I kept on telling like it's certificate, certificate, what exactly is there in the certificate? Uh, in the certificate, the first thing is there's a hash tree. Uh, hash tree is a data structure which allows, uh, so you have multiple values, you can 
convert these values into cryptographically secure hashes, and then uh, you can combine, uh, put them in these hash trees leaves, which you can then use to generate over a single root hash, which can then be certified. The root hash is 32 bytes, so you can store this root hash in the certified data store, and this is the one which will be certified. The signature is a threshold signature by the subnet on this root hash uh, by the subnet public key. So, so with the subnet public key, uh, you can verify this threshold signature on the root hash. What is a delegation? A delegation, uh, so now it's signed by the subnet, but I only have the IC public key, right? So you want some way to link uh, between the IC root key and the subnet public key. So that is where the delegation comes in, and this is the uh, structure of the certificate. Now let's see a live example of using certified data with using a simple counter canister. Now in this, I have a, this is a counter actor, and I have this type of certified counter, just two values, which is a certificate, and this is of type blob, and a value, which is the integer, which is going to be the counter which we provide. I also have the shared variable, which is this counter uh, count, which is going, which is the one which is going to be incrementing. There is a uh, update called inc, which when you call each time it increments the function, uh, increments the counter. But I've also added this part of the method where I basically convert that uh, count into a block and then I set it into the certified data. So now once I set it, uh, it automatically generates a certificate and there is nothing the user needs to do here. Now, there is also this uh, query, which is val. So when I want to get what's the current count value, I can basically retrieve it by this val function, which returns the count along with the certificate. So this get certificate gets the certificate for this data, uh, and then the, both of them are returned along this function. Now let's query this ink method. You see, you can see the current value is four. Uh, now let's query. And here you get the big amount of data, which is the certificate and the small value, which is four, which is the value of the counter. As I mentioned, this uh, certificate has a defined structure and which I explained in the previous slide. So this is how we could validate the data. This is all good in theory, but how do you work it in practice? And that too in Motoko. Since, uh, uh, since the canister can only store 32 bytes of certified data, the solution doesn't scale for multiple variables or large amount of data. Rust developers currently use this uh, library, which definitely provides, which is IC certified map, to store the hash of multiple variables in a map, and they can be consumed into a single hash into 35 bytes. And that is the thing which the subnet will sign over. For Motoko, this is currently under construction, but you also have a hash tree, but the that is for low level builders to actually build the library to actually use certified data. Uh, if you if someone is interested, they can go over it. And there is a currently an issue open for Motoko base to get this implemented. Verifying the certification is a lot more involved since it has some structure to it. Uh, and you need to know about how to access the delegations and stuff to currently properly value, uh, uh, verify the certificate. So that is why uh, we don't roll your own verification and instead use clients like AgentJS to perform the validation. If you want to read more about the uh, information on the certification, you can visit the interface spec uh, certification link. Now, finally, to see this in practice, we also use this a uh, query with certified variables in a lot of places. One of the places where we use is our CMC canister, where you can query the CMC canister to retrieve the average ICP XTR conversion rate, uh, which is the, uh, the, uh, the RKP4C is the canister rate of the CMC. And you can just call this method get average ICP XTR conversion rate. And uh, in the method, you will get the full day, full structure of the certificate, which is the hash tree, the value, uh, the delegation. Uh, I don't think you need the delegation because it's, the, it's in the NNS subnet, but you also get the cert certificate and the signature. That concludes my part of the lecture. And now 
will take questions. All right. Um, I can't start my video. Okay. So we have video now. Cool. Um, so we have a, a lot of questions. Thanks for that. Um, I think the first one's on, on my topic. So let's start with those. Morris, I think it was you who asked if you can um, fix this panic stuff by doing a try catch. Um, so let's quickly have a look at um, try catching in the token, because I think there's a caveat there that I already explains it. Um, so you can already see it here, right? They, they put the try around uh, an anchor canister call. And if I remember the documentation correctly, but I can't really find it directly, is that it only catches um, issues with intercanister calls. So it doesn't catch a panic. And maybe I can try to prepare this um, as, as a demo as well. But I, I remember trying this as, uh, surrounding by a try catch, and it actually um, didn't do anything like it didn't catch. So that's not a, a proper solution that we can use. Uh, is it in this one? No. <laughs> Where is the five cash stuff in here? Oh, wait, my three words in somewhere. Hello? Yeah, so it actually says it here, right? So catch an error only in async. So it doesn't catch uh, traps like the one we introduced. I hope that answers your first question. Um, then we have a question from Ellie. Uh, is it not possible just to make the request wait until lock is free instead of sending an error? So basically what you're saying is uh, here in our implementation where we lock, here we would just do some sort of loop or wait, uh, call a wait function, which you typically do, right? In multi-threaded programming, you can um, say pause my thread and uh, execute another thread that maybe unlocks the lock. And then later when you come back to my thread, I will recheck if the lock is freed up. Now in our case, um, as long as you're waiting or running some, some loop in here, your message will keep on executing. And not only will, be that, will that be pretty expensive with respect to cycle cost, also, that means that no other message is actually executed. So no other message will call this um, line 51 to release the lock back to false. So I don't think this would actually work unless you have something else in mind. Uh, please comment on that one. Yeah, I think the main issue with busy waiting is that it's going to cost you a lot when you implement it that way. So that's why it's better to just return an error if, you, if the lock is active so that the client side can handle what to do with the error and how it can reprocess the request. Yeah, maybe maybe you can make it work if in your busy wait, you do like an inter canister call to some other canister, because <laughs> then that would be a different message. And then maybe uh, a message on this canister can actually uh, continue executing to release the lock, but that's not, not a great solution either. Yeah. Um, so again, I hope that answers your question. Then we have a question for you, Venkatesh, from Moritz. Why do we uh, have nanoseconds granularity uh, on the time API if time is not accurate anyways? Uh, so time being accurate, I don't think it's guaranteed formally, but I think the, uh, that, I mean, the, the API still tries to stick to close to real time. But uh, why we have nanosecond granularity, I don't think I have answer right now. I need to check, but that's something which I'm not sure. Yeah, um, to be honest, we have no idea when this was uh, decided by who. Um, yeah. So maybe we can check with the team that, that decided or implemented this, but maybe this is also just the result of, of some, some defaults somewhere um, or some, some technical considerations. Uh, yeah, no idea, <laughs> to be honest. Yep. And I think, yeah. So there is a question from Lee on the 
okay the certified data which i think he's referring to the can you provide me the link to which gist you're talking about okay i think he has written several things on certified assets but the example which i showed is very simple here uh, i know that my value is not going to go beyond 32 bytes so that's why i'm storing it directly in the certified data set store but when you're actually handling like multiple values or uh, for example like assets right if you want to use certified assets and stuff you possibly want to use a hash tree and maintain that hash tree to properly store your hashes of the values which you're trying to certify and then build the root hash and then get the certificate over that so i think that is probably the way that probably yokim has implemented the structure and that would be the way to go i think in motoko right now we have like limited tooling as to how to implement this we do have a hash tree uh type which you can do to build over certified data but i think this is pretty low level and you need to build over a lot of stuff i would wait for uh, some high level api to appear to probe before using certified variables on motoko i think there is a similar implementation called ic certified map which allows you to play with multiple variables or rust but for motoko you need to wait for some time and i think there was also a question from uh certified assets library i'm not sure if it's being worked on for motoko so yeah let me let me read the question out loud because it's going to be part of the recording also more it's also do you know if that certified asset library from motoko is being worked on internally at the moment and that between brackets issue 409 uh so issue 409 allows you to it's not for the certified assets but it allows you to use certified variables so when you have like in this example i only stored the counter right in a single variable but you have like multiple variables which you want to expose via queries and get the certified response then you need to have like a certified map which you can store the values and then retrieve via the certificate so that's the issue which i referred to as for certified assets i'm not sure Okay, and then there's uh, an, a question from Anonymous. How the distinction of principal and account allow for more complex and private interactions between users and assets? Um, so I'm guessing you're talking about the ICP Ledger API, where you can generate accounts from principals. Uh, I have more complex interaction between users and assets. Maybe you could clarify your question further. Actually, I can. If I pull this into the recording, maybe this helps. So yeah, in our case, we, we basically track uh, people's balances based on their principles. Um, and if I'm correct on the ICP ledger, you first generate an account, uh, which is derived from your principal, and you can have multiple accounts. So maybe that's the first benefit that it allows you to have multiple accounts. Um, and I also think that it's not easy or uh, feasible uh, computationally to go back from having an account to who the principal is uh, tied to that account. So in that sense, it might guarantee some privacy. Bankitesh, do you understand something different under this question? I'm not sure I'm getting the full picture. Maybe you can try to ask the question again. It's... OK, is there anything else? No. Nope. All right. Uh, cool. If there are no more, so if there are, if you think of stuff afterwards, uh, you, you can reach us on the forum. Uh, if there are no more questions now, I think we can close up.
And like uh, Moritz, you asked this question, right? Is this being worked on? Well, the easiest way to notice is to search on the forums because often there are already discussions ongoing and definitive answers uh, on the forums. And if not, you can always open up a topic if you're curious if, if someone's working on this or if you just want to push uh, up the priority because our, our roadmap is also partially community driven, like we're trying to evolve towards that. So if, if the community is really in favor of some features, this is certainly taken into account in prioritization. Um, and, and that's best discussed by the forums. All right, good. Um, so if there's no further questions, let's close it up. And thanks everyone for attending and good luck with your bootcamp projects. Yep, have a great time. <laughs>